Over the last century of film, there's been many technological advances. However, the creation of computer graphic imagery, or CGI, sticks out as the biggest game changer of modern cinema. The ability to create photorealistic worlds with nothing but computers has unshackled filmmakers in all genres and opened doors to a realm of storytelling only a few decades ago would have been considered impossible. In this video essay, I'll introduce you to Michael Crichton, a man who's often overlooked yet remains as integral to the industry as he was nearly half a century ago. He's the father of Westworld and Jurassic Park, and without his stories, cinema CGI wouldn't be as you know it. At the beginning of this month, HBO premiered their new series Westworld, a $100 million science fiction epic that showcases the current quality of cinematic content. What you may not know though is that the show is actually a remake of a landmark film in CGI history. Westworld is a fable of corporate greed inspired by Disneyland and released in 1973. It was originally created by Michael Crichton, an established author of highbrow intellectual science fiction and director. In his script, Crichton proposed that his antagonist robot, played by Yul Brenner in his Magnificent Seven costume, to possess computerized vision. In the 1970s, however, there was no effect houses as we know today, forcing Crichton to turn to John Whitney, a famed artist renowned for animating Hitchcock's title sequence in Vertigo, to produce the two minutes of CGI. What Whitney created was the first use of CGI in the history of feature films, in the effect now used to pixelate profanities. Westworld became MGM's highest grossing film of the year, and the success led them to greenlighting the sequel Future World, despite an exhausted Crichton stepping away. The film failed to live up to the predecessor's success, but it did feature the first 3D digitally composited hand. The technological advancement was created by Edwin Catmull, who would go on to build the Pixar empire a decade later. However, this innovation led him to being headhunted by George Lucas first for the new CGI division in his graphic company Industrial Light and Magic, or ILM. The new section, however, wasn't well received by the original employees who saw the rising technology as a threat to their craft. And this friction between the old and new age continued well into the next decade, with the CGI heavy Tron being refused nomination at the Motion Picture Academy Awards for cheating with computers in 1982. On the break of the new millennium, however, Steven Spielberg approached ILM with a new project that would cement CGI as the future, Crichton's Jurassic Park. Spielberg wanted ILM to co-venture with practical effects studio Tibbet to bring the dinosaurs and Crichton's novel to life. However, once production began, the ILM animators realised they could do the whole thing in CGI themselves, and, despite not being authorised, they went ahead and began constructing dinosaurs for their own demos. When Tibbet's employees found out that ILM had overstepped, it almost led to a physical confrontation, but the demo went to Spielberg, was screened, and allegedly people cried seeing it. There was no comparison between the innovative photorealistic CGI to the stop-motion alternative, and people started to realise the magnitude of this new technology. It was like a giant switch was thrown overnight, Catmull said, of Jurassic Park's unprecedented premiere. No one was doing anything remotely to ILM's standard at the time, but the movie pushed for such a swift takeover of the industry. Visual effect companies such as Disney's former Buena Vista went from 6 people to over 35 within a year, and movies once thought impossible were greenlit on the strength of CGI demos. I was amazed by all the larger creatures were insanely beautiful, and I found out that they had taken some of the programs from Jurassic Park and applied them to elephants and rhinos. Now I'm a big fan of practical effects, I always have been. They're real cars and real people in a real desert. We could have done a lot of things, but we went to Abu Dhabi, we went to Ireland and into the forest of Wales and shot plates in, in Iceland and built these enormous uh, sets, interior and exterior, because it, it, we wanted the movie to never feel like it was shot uh, in a vacuum of green screen or blue screen. We wanted to, you know, and working with these puppeteers. Promoting practical effects over digital is becoming a regular occurrence, even if that doesn't truly replicate the makeup of the film. For an example, Mad Max, despite being marketed as solely a practical film, contains CGI in 80% of its shots. So what is the problem audiences have with CGI? The answer lies in the quality of the movie as a whole. When a movie is fantastic and elicits a strong emotional response from the audience, good CGI goes unnoticed and bad CGI is overlooked. However, if the movie fails to entertain the audience, the first thing that sticks out to them is the bad quality of the effects, and that is what remains with them. Even if the CGI is done well, if the movie fails to live up to expectations, CGI gets the bad rap for overuse and is blamed for the lacking narrative. Crichton's stories have been at the forefront of CGI's innovative development since the beginning. 
They first introduced CGI to feature films and helped it take over the industry. To this day, his stories epitomise the merger of strong narratives with high quality effects and this is why they'll continue to entertain audiences for many more years to come.